some of the work we're doing is looking at how we go from thought to language. And I'm particularly interested in how the brain allows us to achieve this. Also, when we have damage to portions of the brain, how that affects language and then how we might treat it. And so what I'm going to be talking to you today about is how our knowledge of the brain can improve our treatments of language and communication. So we all have moments where we go blank. You might have a person, you don't remember their name. I have this with my own family sometimes. <laughs> um, or uh, it may be, who was the, what was the name of your teacher in year one? I'm still struggling with this. I asked myself this question two days ago. Um, but we often have these phenomena where we might remember part of the name, we might know it, but we can't come up with the full name. So we have, it's like a tip of the tongue. So it's on the tip of your tongue. Most people experience this once a week. Sometimes as we get older, you might get it more frequently. You might get it under certain circumstances. So this is when language breaks down temporarily. But now if you can, I've got another one there. So you might know what this is, but you can't quite think of the name. Does anyone know what it is? Okay, there's a few people who are too clever. Um, that was meant to stump you and then you were meant to think and struggle with it. Um, again, it made me struggle. So it's a harpsichord. So what we, what we have is in people who've, particularly those who've had a stroke and in other neurological conditions, that frustrating situation of not being able to get the right word at the right time can be permanent and it can last for the rest of your life. So in up to a third of people who have a stroke, they have aphasia. So they have a loss of either the ability to produce language or comprehend language or both. And so if you can imagine for the comprehension, it's like people are talking another language. You can't extract meaning from what you're hearing. It's just gibberish. Or you can understand everything and you can't say what you're wanting to say. So imagine not being able to convey your feelings, what you want or what you need. So it's incredibly frustrating and it's part of what makes us human is our ability to communicate. So this can go awry, particularly if you have a, a stroke affecting certain portions of a language network that we now know about. So this man here um, has had a stroke involving the left hemisphere where language is predominant. And he, for almost all questions trying to convey anything with meaning, he can only say tono. So that's it. He can comprehend, as you'll see, but that's all he can say, except at the end there'll be a surprise. That's his response to how many children do you have? What number is this? Right? Right? Now let's count it out. One, two, three, four. Nice, nice. Well, since you did four so well, let's, let's go for broke. Let's go up to 20 if you can. Hold on. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 10, 12, 12, 1, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, So as you can see, he can comprehend some of the questions. He's still using prosody, so we use melody to try and convey meaning. And he has some automatic speech. So this is one of the mysteries of the brain is things are stored in different ways in the brain. So when you have damage to certain portions, you might have spared automatic speech. But if you want to convey anything with meaning, you might have difficulties like this. So when someone presents, for instance, after having a stroke and they have aphasia, one of the key questions people have is, will I recover? How quickly and to what extent? So will I be able to communicate normally again? And for us, one of the things that drives our research is the fact that we actually don't have an answer for that. So at the moment, all we can say is the more severe your aphasia, the, more, the less likely you are to fully recover. But besides that, it's fairly much a guess at the moment. So what we're interested in doing 
is harnessing new technologies in brain imaging to get a better prediction, to get an answer for that person about whether they will recover and how well and how quickly. So up until recently, our idea of how the brain achieves this remarkable feat of language, it hasn't moved much for several hundred years. So in the 1800s, this man with the fine uh, sideburns um, observed that a patient of his called Laborn had a similar deficit to the video I just showed you, where this person could just say tan, 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 tan. On autopsy, he observed that he had a, a stroke that affected a particular part of the brain in the frontal cortex that we now know as Broca's, as Broca's area. What we now know is that this simple idea of there being a couple of language centres in the brain um, is very much an oversimplified view. Peter mentioned some of the complexities of how our brains are, are structured and how they function, and in language this is particularly the case where what we achieve is incredibly complex when you think about it. One of the other really amazing things is how quickly we, our brain processes language. So by the time I get to the end of a sentence, you will have heard sounds, mapped them onto representations in your brain of those sounds, ordered the sounds into words, ordered the words into a sentence and extracted a meaning. So we do that on the fly as we're going. And any of those processes can break down. Now that we have uh, brain imaging, we can actually start to look at language as it's occurring in the brain. So this gives us a huge opportunity to understand why it breaks down and how we might eventually treat it then. So this is an example of someone hearing a word. And that's in milliseconds down the bottom. So again, it's incredibly rapid what we do. It involves a network of regions, not just one. And it differs depending on what we're doing with language. So seeing a word will start at the end, the back end of the brain and move forward in this wave that happens incredibly quickly. So we now have this technology to start looking at what happens in the brain when someone does have aphasia and do they, will, are they likely to recover? So what we've started to do in um, recent studies is we've looked at healthy individuals listening to words where we actually observe that there's this traditional idea that only the left hemisphere is involved in language. Actually, for some aspects of language, the right hemisphere plays a role too. What we've observed with people who've had a stroke is they actually, around two weeks after they have a stroke, if they have aphasia, they actually show more activity in the right hemisphere than healthy individuals. So the brain is trying to cope with this insult, trying to recover. Some of this activity might be helpful, but in some cases it's not. So the brain is struggling to recover and regain language. Then as recovery continues, this largely disappears in those people who successfully recover. So the really exciting thing for us is we're now able to get, we're starting to get measures of brain activity and function at this early stage when we want answers about how the person might be functioning in six months, when they go home, will they get back to work? And we're starting to get much better predictors by looking at brain function and structure at that stage and then relating it to outcomes. So this is quite a practical way that we're starting to identify how language recovery works. When we think about what treatments we should be giving, we've often had to treat the brain as a black box. So we try a treatment, something happens in the brain, and then some patients get better and some patients don't. When a treatment succeeds or fails, we actually don't know what's going on in here. It's a bit of a leap of faith at the moment. So what we've started doing is looking at one of the most common things that people with aphasia and other neurological conditions have in language uh, disorders, and that's the ability to name things or retrieve words. So that finding of the right word. So even something as simple as naming this 
involves a number of stages. So to get down to name it as a cat, first what we do in our brain is we go to, it's almost like the dictionary entry for all of the features or the meaning of this. So it purrs, has a tail, fur, pet, four legs. You might store its name. You might store the fact that it peed on the carpet last week. There's all individual things you can store with this. But you access the word meanings before you can get to the actual word form. So this is like the dictionary entry. And then that will fire off the word form for cat. Some people who have problems at this stage will look at that they might activate fur and pet and four legs. They'll come down here and dog will be activated. So they'll see that picture and they'll say dog. Others will be okay here, will select cat here, but then you have to actually get all the sounds together. So you have to get the C-A-T, but you might end up getting some like gat or something here. So there's breakdowns at each of these levels and the type of therapies we do at present target these breakdowns. So what we were interested in looking at is in the same individuals, if you give a treatment that targets this or a treatment that targets this and this, do they use the same brain mechanisms? And up until now, we weren't really sure about this. And what we've observed is Actually, yes, there is a difference if you focus on the word form, so what the word sounds like, what it starts with, these type of things. You often use a region of your temporal lobe that is involved in storing word forms in healthy individuals. If we get you to focus on the meaning, so at that level where it has fur, it's a pet, that type of thing, really interestingly, it involves a different network and the peak area we've found is actually deep within the brain, beyond the cortex where we often think about language traditionally, um, in an area of the basal ganglia. So this is something which has surprised a lot of people because it's beyond tradition, where we were not able to look at this previously. We've also shown that for an individual who has a stroke affecting this region, this might not be the best therapy and similarly for this. So we're starting to get tailored therapy based on patterns of brain activity. The other exciting aspect is we can look at brain activity before the person gets therapy and we're starting to predict which therapy should be the best for that person. Because we got this area that lights up deep within the brain, this actually overlaps with some of the work we've been doing with Professor Silburn looking at deep brain stimulation. So in Parkinson's, although it's often primarily associated with movement disorders, we've also noticed um, aspects of language, including word retrieval um, and higher level cognitive functions that might be affected in people with Parkinson's disease. And so Peter will be talking about this more, but we've actually started, what we've noticed is in people with Parkinson's disease, off their stimulation, there's difficulties in activating and retrieving words, but when the stimulator is on, at least in this paradigm, it's starting to normalise it so it's closer to what healthy controls are doing. What we're currently doing in Parkinson's disease is we're also using language as a window into other mental functions. So we're seeing how people process words with different mood to try and indicate whether we might get better markers of who's more likely to go on and have a mood uh, problem. We're also looking at whether the way that we process words early in Parkinson's might indicate those who are more likely to get cognitive deficits as the disease progresses. So we're using words and language as a window into broader functions. The other thing we need to keep in mind now with this new technology is that it's not just the language centres but it's the connections that Peter talked about before between various regions that are critical for a lot of functions. So what we've managed to do is we've started measuring connectivity in the brain between some of these key centres. And what we've observed is 
how well connected these areas are can predict whether you will respond to a particular type of language therapy. We've also noticed that if you take a measure of this after the therapy, we've showed a change. So I've actually shown a change in connectivity to the point where there's not a difference anymore between a stroke patient who has aphasia and a healthy control in this measure of connectivity. So we're starting to find measures of connectivity and brain function that will help us be more tailored in the type of treatments we provide. Once we've got this idea of where in the brain uh, language is residing, which networks are critical for language and responding to treatment, we can also look then at actually priming the brain uh, directly as a way to enhance treatments. So an idea that has been around for a long time in la some language therapy is there might be pharmacotherapy where bef you're in the waiting room before you get language therapy, you might take a particular drug that will boost treatment effects and make it last longer. But up until now, there's been a lot of hit and misses with this type of idea, and I think that's because we haven't had an understanding of the brain mechanisms involved. So interestingly, Winston Churchill used to um, take dexamphetamine before he gave a speech, which he found enhanced his performance. <laughs> and I haven't taken dexamphetamine before this talk. But we've followed some of this up to look at drugs that prime and again, that subcortex, so deep within the brain, and they can have a dramatic effect on things like word learning. So this is people on dexamphetamine versus a placebo. And if a month later, so you've got a 60% accuracy compared to 30% on your ability to learn new words, then a month later you can get these people back and you've still got this large effect on learning. So we're priming the brain and it's enhancing the ability to learn, and what we're hoping to do then is look at relearning. And finally, one other way we can, with this new knowledge about brain activity that is critical to recovery, we can directly stimulate things, both with deep, stimu deep brain stimulation and with non-invasive brain stimulation. So this is with a colleague, Marcus Meinzer at UQCCR, and when stimulating this region that we, all, we observed was critical for language recovery, again, we're showing this enhanced learning of language through this stimulation at the scalp level. So we're starting to identify then networks that you might prime or boost in order to enhance recovery. And finally, there's other more low-tech uh, solutions to some of these things that we're starting to look at. So it's a really hot topic at the moment is thinking about how exercise interacts with cognition and learning and language. So there's a, there's a group in Germany who've got people cycling for 30 minutes, then they're much more able to learn language, which is kind of odd. But we're, we're starting to look at the brain mechanisms that might underpin that. So again, it's another solution to enhance outcome and recovery that might be quite simple. So we're starting to model that. So all of this new knowledge um, of both how language is processed in the brain, how we recover, and how treatments work can improve our prediction of recovery and identify which people should be getting which treatments to optimise their recovery. It's also going to open up new targets for brain-based treatments of language. And, but this is in a preliminary stage, but together these type of advances will have the potential to um, improve communication and enhance quality of life. Thank you.